The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Thanks for joining us. Today's webinar is on best practices in fire and life safety. I'm Ann Cosgrove, the Editor-in-Chief of Facility Executive Magazine, and this webinar is presented by Notifier by Honeywell. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items with you. Please note the control panel that is on your screen. This is where you can submit questions in the question box in that panel for the speaker. You can send in questions at any time, and those will be addressed after the presentation. Also, please note the orange arrow on the left side of your control panel. Clicking on that arrow will either expand or collapse the control panel, so please be sure it is expanded and you can access the question box. Also, if at any time you experience a technical difficulty, you can send a message to us in that question section and someone will address you privately right away. If you are interested in continuing education credits, note that you'll receive a certificate of attendance in an email from facility executive after the webinar, and you can report to your association for the CEUs. So now I'd like to introduce your speaker today, Jacob Frazier. Jacob is a product marketing manager for Notifier, and he Jacob joined Honeywell in 1999, and he's held various roles in test engineering, technical support, customer service, and marketing. Jacob holds an associate's degree in computer engineering and a bachelor's degree in information technology. So we're looking forward to hearing a good wealth of information today on this topic, and uh, welcome, Jacob. Hi, thank you, Ann. So welcome, everybody. Um, we'll quickly run through the agenda. So today we're going to go through some of the industry best practices and wanted to to touch on uh, a few things that have uh, been becoming of increasing importance in the industry recently. So we'll, we'll go through some information about uh, bi-directional ampl amplifiers, um, they're also, no, also known as uh, emergency communication systems, advanced detection, both uh, carbon monoxide and some aspiration, low frequency notification, and we'll close it out by talking a little bit about automated test and inspection. So during an emergency, reliable communication is critical for our first responders. They need to be confident that the information that they receive from their radio transmissions are clear in order to prevent any additional injuries and save people's lives, including their own. So there, the problem is uh, an issue with coverage. So the problem today is that many firefighters and other emergency responders um, run into issues when they go into buildings or areas where the coverage is poor, um, especially newer buildings that are made out of concrete, metal, um, and other uh, normal building materials. Also, the increase in the use of low E glass has become a, an increasing problem with radio coverage. And also when they're in, going into below ground structures and, and other places where radio signals have an, a hard time getting past uh, these materials to end, and they're, they're in these, these dead spots. So what is a BDA system? A BDA or bidirectional amplification system is used to enhance in-building radio frequency signal coverage. Uh, and so similar to the adoption of mass notification systems, the terminology has changed uh, over time from mass notification to emergency communication systems. So sometimes you may hear multiple terms used, including DAS or DAS, which is the distributed antenna system. Uh, but all these systems are, they mean the same thing. They distribute the signal strength from the outside to the internal uh, building structure. So BDAs are life safety systems. Uh, they are connected and supervised by the building's fire alarm system. They're typically purchased with the fire alarm system and they should be installed, tested and qualified by factory certified technicians. Um, just like your the other aspects of your fire alarm inspection system, uh, they are inspected by the AHA or authority of jurisdiction. There are code-driven requirements around BDA systems, um, and you'll see as we go through this, uh, this presentation that each jurisdiction may have some slightly different requirements. So we'll talk a little, a little bit about the basics of uh, two-way two -way radios and BDAs. So there's two modes of two-way communication radios. So there's uh, direct radio to radio and also repeated. So the direct radio to radio or simplex communication is where two radios are communicating directly with one another. 
Uh, this is great for if you're want to talk to just if there's two first responders, they want to communicate with each other within the building. That's that's perfectly fine. That's acceptable. Um, there's no issues there. One radio communicating with another, or in the repeated aspect, or a duplex system is where there is a radio repeater in the middle, where uh, one radio signal goes out to a tower and then comes back to reach the other radio. So all the transmissions are received and rebroadcasted um, at higher power by that repeater in the middle. So direct or simplex radio communications, the advantage of these are they're simple, they're reliable, great for short range uh, distances. And again, if they're, uh, you know, just one one to one communications from uh, one first responder to another within a building, it's not a big deal. They they work great for that purpose. Uh, the large disadvantage is that they do have a very short range, and they're only acceptable for very small buildings. If you get into larger building structures, now even that simplex radio communication from one first responder to another becomes uh, a little bit more challenging. Uh, your duplex frequency systems, the advantage of those, it's great radio signal coverage over a lot wider area. Uh, but the drawback here is that the radio signals have to get to the repeater in order for them to uh, to work and to be reliable. So when we get into situations where, you know, like I talked about with uh, buildings that have the low E glass or difficult building structures, um, it's it's very difficult for the radio signal to get outside to the repeater and then the repeater signal back to the first responder. So you you end up losing communication from the first responder to uh, your, your ground command and vice versa. So different bidirectional amplifiers uh, have different frequency models. Um, so there's the public safety band for two-way radio, two-way radios only. Only 13% of people are using the, this band uh, in the 700 hertz frequency. So on VHF, uh, from 150 to 174 megahertz, it's typically used by older radio systems. And they require coverage in uh, a wire, wider geographical areas. Uh, it's estimated that about 20% of public safety um, is on this on this this frequency band. So it's great for outdoor coverage, but has very poor in-building performance. Uh, and the UHF band, 450 to 520 megahertz range, uh, is common common for uh, public. It's also common for public safety, and we've estimated that about 40% of jurisdictions use this band today. Um, that frequency range has very good performance, both outdoors and inside buildings but it's a very limited frequency uh, availability. So it's mostly used for conventional systems. Um, the 800 megahertz range is most commonly used for public safety systems and about 30% of people are using this, this frequency range today. Uh, these are all mainly newer systems and this band has great indoor coverage, uh, but it's not as good for outdoor coverage. And so for this reason, these systems are either simulcast or they're multi-site uh, trunking systems. Uh, the 700 megahertz frequency band is a recent addition to public, public safety frequency pool of, of, uh, of frequencies. Uh, portions of this band are dedicated to uh, what's called FirstNet, or a, uh, there's a future, a future um, system that's planned for, for later on. Um, and about 10% of jurisdictions are currently using this, this, uh, this frequency band for voice communications. So I wanna talk a little bit about the code requirements around BDA. So some of the fire code terminology that's commonly used, um, like I mentioned, you'll hear different terms for, for BDA systems. It's also commonly known as an ERCES or Emergency Radio Communication Enhancement System. Um, so those are in-building systems uh, for emergency responder radio systems and public safety. Um, there is also an auxiliary radio communication system or ARC system, which is mainly used in the New York City and uh, Long Island area. Public Safety Signal Booster, PSB, PSSB, 
uh, or public safety and building communication systems. So those systems are also used. So code development. So in building life safety concerns, we want to make sure that we are able to protect the public and protect our first responders. So we want to make sure that we're protecting the people who are protecting us. And that's exactly what PDA systems are, are meant to do. Um, standardization and consistency for this in-building public safety system will help increase that throughout the country. So BDA systems are a code-driven requirement. Um, and the IBC 2015 edition refers to uh, IFC section 510 for the state recognized code. So depending upon what version of uh, IBC and IFPA 72 um, different jurisdictions are on will determine um, how the code is, is being adopted and where it's being enforced across the country today. So currently there are 28 states, including the District of Columbia, that do require BDA systems. See and four more have adopted IBC. So this is the current map showing uh, international fire code adoption. So as you can see on the map, many have uh, already adopted the IFC 2015 version uh, and many more are are moving on to the either 2012 or 2009. So is BDA enforceable? Yes, it absolutely is, but it does depend on whether it is required by the uh, authority having jurisdiction where you are located. Now, there are also some city ordinances that do require BDA. For, exa for example, Florida um, has a mandate that every building over 75 feet must have radio signal strength survey performed by December 31st of this year. And any buildings that fail have two years to install a BDA system to correct uh, that signal strength survey. So as required by the code, the responsibility is on the building owners. Um, they're responsible for the maintenance, the site surveys, and upgrades. So it is up to the building owners or um, maintenance personnel to make sure that the buildings do meet the requirements um, for in-building signal strength. Uh, they're responsible for doing those um, signal strength surveys to ensure that they meet or exceed what is required by uh, IBC and uh, the NFPA. So UL 20, uh, 2524 is a new product standard. So it creates a performance standard that allows manufacturers to design and test their BDA systems against. So this ensures that authorities have jurisdiction, building owners, occupants, that uh, any of the systems that are manufactured meet a specific standard and they all function the, the same way. Uh, it's become the standard to which all BDA systems have to be listed with. Uh, NFPA 72 10.3.1 10 says the equipment constructed and installed in conformity with the code shall be listed for the purpose for which it is used. So when you're selecting a BDA system, you should make sure that it is listed to the UL 2524 standard, which not all uh, in building radio systems are. So in the past, um, many radio radio companies have been um, selling and installing these uh, in building radio systems, but they are not battery backed up. They're not supervised. They're not connected to the fire alarm panel and they do not meet the UL 2524 standard. So this brand new product standard for BDA systems covers products that are used for uh, two-way ECRE, uh, CES, or BDA systems that are installed in a location to improve the, the wireless communication at that location. And currently UL ensures 100% compliance to this standard. 
currently there's only five companies that are listed to UL24. So they're listed here. So Gimbal FCI, Honeywell International, uh, us here at Notifier, Radio Solutions Inc. and Silent Night. So the way that the BDA system works to provide uh, more reliable and big in-building coverage is what you'll see here is there is a uh, bi-directional amplifier here installed inside the building with an antenna that's connected to that, uh, that amplifier. So now um, if there's any, any issues with uh, the construction of the building, or any of those building materials or hard to reach areas like basements or anything like that down below. Um, what this system does is it allows the radio signals to reach from the tower to the donor antenna, and then they're distributed down to this amplifier. That signal is amplified internally here within the building and then distributed throughout the building through coax cable. And you'll see at the bottom here, there's a, uh, the fire alarm control panel there to monitor the entire system and in the standard pit panel there as well with it. So again, what this allows uh, allows for is to see the fire ground command to be able to communicate with the tower, the personnel inside the building will be able to communicate with the folks on the outside as well as communicate from uh, one first responder to another within the building. Um, using this system at, because it amplifies the signal strength from the outside internally within the building. So that way there's no coverage loss. So the notifier solution for BDA systems, uh, there is a, uh, a complete system that's offered from notifier. It comes with all of the components that are required for uh, a BDA system. It comes with a, a signal booster or amplifier batteries, the donor antennas, and as well as the, um, the coax cable and, and backup supplies. The systems are installed, serviced, and maintained by uh, factory authorized trained notifier independent systems engineers. So they are all trained by, um, by a company called RSI, who we've partnered with. And we provide the training to all of our distributors so that way they can be, uh, they can go out and make sure that they're installing and maintaining and st testing and inst installing these the systems um, to the standards. So the notifier system is UL2524 listed. It is, um, it does comply with an MPA 72 uh, 2010 edition and it is also CSFM listed for our folks out in California. Our solution also comes in a, this is the, the amplifier here that's shown on the screen. Uh, it comes in a NEMAS 4 certified UL listed enclosure. Other companies will just sell or certify a NEMA 4, a NEMA 4 enclosure um, that is UL listed but then they modify it to build in the BDA and doing that will void the NEMA certification. So the notifier solution, the, the entire enclosure with the assembly installed is NEMA 4 certified. So the situation we're, we're coming up against is the emergency responders or firefighters and EMS who will have to rely on these two-way communications to be able to complete their everyday operations and save lives and save and protect themselves. Um, and our solution from notifiers, it, it will allow them to enhance that in-building radio frequency coverage with our BDA system and distributed antenna system. So the next topic I wanna to touch on is advanced detection. So there's a couple of sections within this one that we'll talk through here. So what do you think about when you imagine a fire alarm system? Most people think about the classic spot type smoke detectors that we see on the ceiling, uh, but fire systems and detection technology have advanced far beyond that over the years. 
So our current fire systems do more than just simply protect, detect smoke and sound an alarm when there's a fire. They've involved into complex life safety systems that protect us from dangers that most people take for granted. And one silent danger today that our systems help protect us against is carbon monoxide. So some facts about carbon monoxide or CO. It is an odorless, colorless, and tasteless gas. And carbon monoxide is also known as the silent killer. So carbon monoxide or CO um, is generated from the incomplete combustion of carbon-based fuel. So burning of you know, anything from the or from coal, wood, charcoal, oil, gases, uh, propane, natural gas, all of those things uh, create carbon, carbon monoxide. So some common sources of carbon, carbon monoxide or CO are your gas ranges or ovens, um, heating systems, power, power tools, portable generators. Um, per the CDC, on average, there are 408 deaths per year that can be attributed to carbon monoxide poisoning and 21% of them have occurred in non-residential and commercial homes. Uh, so something that's been in the, in the news fairly recently has been CO poisoning from pool heaters. So you wouldn't really think of a, a danger of, of a pool heater usually since it's not usually in a, a sleeping room, but uh, in North Carolina a few years ago, there was a grandmother and a grandson that were actually killed due to a pool heater that was leaking CO and it just happened to be adjacent to a mechanical room. So this is definitely a, a major concern. Um, it is a life safety issue. Some of the health effects of CO depend on a couple of things. Um, the concentration of the CO gas and the length of exposure to, to carbon monoxide, as well as an individual's overall health. So children, uh, elderly, or people with pre-existing physical conditions might be more susceptible to the effects of CO. The table on the slide here is from a 2009 edition of the NFPA uh, 720, and it shows the relationship between the, the volume of CO and the length of exposure and the system that can re result. So the longer you're exposed to, to these concentrations of, of this gas, um, you can have anything from a headache, you start to feel drowsy, and then eventually you know, collapse, pass out, and then eventually could be fatal. So many of these symptoms are very similar to the flu, such as a headache or fatigue. So the only main symptom that's missing is a fever. So many people will go to, go to sleep thinking that uh, they're just starting to come down with something, they lay down, um, and then they're over, overtaken by CO poisoning. Some codes and legislations uh, with, from, for carbon monoxide detector applications. Uh, primary applications requiring CO detection are commercial sleeping spaces. So hotels, motels, um, nursing homes, or other managed care facilities, college dorms. Um, in most cases, those rooms either have a fuel burning appliance that are either uh, in that room or near the room. So like laundry rooms or mechanical rooms uh, with those sleeping spaces within the building. Uh, another growing trend is also schools. So in 2014, there were students and adults that were hospitalized for carbon monoxide poisoning at a school near Boston. So any of these, we're starting to see more uh, schools requiring carbon monoxide detectors within the building to make sure that their students and faculty are kept safe. Uh, so there are three main codes that affect the, uh, the use of CO detection in either the fire alarm systems or even standalone applications. So there's NFPA 720, um, the International Building Code, uh, and, FP, and then NFPA 101, which is the Life Safety Code. Uh, NFPA 720 is the standard that covers the installation, inspection, and testing guidelines specifically for carbon monoxide detection equipment. Uh, so it's very similar to NFPA 72, but related just to CO detection. In 
In the 2012 IPC uh, is when we start to see the requirement for seal detection in any new or existing Group R or Group I occupancies. So it specifically states that under certain conditions, uh, if there is a contached, I'm sorry, attached garage that contains or contains a fuel burning appliance, then you will need to install seal detection in accordance to NFPA 720. Uh, under the NFPA 101 Life Safety Code, it addresses the requirements for uh, building service and fire protection equipment. So they added again in 2012 edition that a certain occupancy uh, requires carbon, carbon monoxide detection and warning equipment that it has to be provided in accordance with the guidelines, again, referring back to NFPA 720. So in daycare homes where clients can be uh, sleeping or in the following uh, conditions, if there's a fuel fired equipment uh, or an enclosed parking structure, those places have to be protected by uh, CO detection, as well as any new lodging or rooming houses. So again, anything that is communicating or attached to a uh, attached garage or that contain a fuel burning appliance. Also hotels, dormitories, and brand new apart apartment buildings that have attached garage. All of these types of occupancies require CO detection. So some, some do's and don'ts of CO detector placement. So it is okay to place the CO detector on the wall or the ceiling. Um, if it's on the wall, it should be no less than four inches down from the ceiling. If it's placed on the ceiling, at least 12 inches away from any wall and within three feet of the peak if, the, if it's a vaulted ceiling. Uh, most system connected CO detectors can be placed uh, on either, or, either wall or ceiling. Some people think that carbon dioxide detectors have to be placed close to the floor, but based on the molecular weight of carbon monoxide, it's actually lighter than air. So when you consider the behavior of carbon monoxide gas, it typically will rise from the point of production, uh, usually, which is a usually a, a heat event, so some fuel burning appliance or something like that, uh, and then it'll mix evenly with the air as it starts to cool. So it. So even though we do state that uh, it's okay to place a CO detector on the, either the wall or the ceiling, it's always recommended to consult with uh, the NFPA 72 and your local AHJ for what they require for uh, CO detector placement. So some, some don'ts for CO detector placement, um, not within 10 feet of any cooking appliance, because then you can get some, some false alarms. Um, directly above a sink or oven, next to doors or windows, because those things can uh, dissipate the CO and you won't get good detection. Uh, the airflow can be obstructed, um, or it can, you know also you also don't want to place them in an outside garage or in an unfinished attic. Uh, and so because those places you can get dust or dirt buildup, which can collect and then block the CO sensor. So the, one of the notifier solutions for CO detection is that we provide a advanced multi-criteria uh, fire CO detector. Um, this, de this detector provides protection for fire and CO in one device. Um, it uses multiple detection methods for fire and then it also includes uh, a separate CO detection and it also uses CO detection for the fire detection portion as well. Um, so including putting these two devices to, in together uh, saves money on installation time. It also, excuse me, it also improves the aesthetics of the building. So here's one uh, application of a of CO. So there is a smoke detector on a sounder base with a separate carbon monoxide detector, and then a horn for your general evacuation for the fire alarm system. With the Notifier Advanced Mindset Multi-Criteria Fire and CO Combo Detector uh, and a sounder base, you can consolidate all these devices into one compact solution. So now instead of having three or four devices on the wall doing different things, everything is combined into one 
one device, one junction box, and uh, it also only takes up one address on our addressable loop for the fire panel. And this is also a much, much more cost-effective solution, uh, both from installation, maintenance, um, and, and uh, truly parts standpoint. I want to talk a little bit about aspiration detection. So aspiration detection is an alternative method of detecting smoke in lieu of using the traditional spot type smoke detectors. Aspiration detectors provide very, can provide very early warning detection of smoke, which is why they're traditionally used mainly for mission critical applications, but they're also capable of reliable operation in very harsh environments where traditional smoke detectors could fail or cause uh, costly false alarms. So aspiration detectors use optical air sampling to detect minuscule amounts of smoke in an environment. So there's a network of pipes that come from the, uh, from the aspiration detector and they're spread out throughout the protected area. They're used to pull air into the detection chamber. Then the, the air sample is moved through that chamber uh, by only dust or particles, so that way it can purify the air sample. Then once that air sample is cleaned, it's moved to a detection chamber where it's uh, exposed to a high sta highly stable laser beam. And then any particles of smoke will scatter the light Causing the um, causing the detector to 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 be able to determine if there is uh, smoke present within that chamber, and then that light signal is passed on to a processor where it can be translated into a level of smoke. So you'll know you will be able to sense that there is smoke present and also uh, display what that smoke level is within that protected area. So mission critical sites like data and telecommunication centers and high tech manufacturing facilities have traditionally employed aspiration smoke detection because it's capable of providing very, very early warning of an impending fire hazard. So even a tiny bit of smoke, it will cause the detector to go into an alarm state to notify someone that, hey, you need to come to check out this area. Um, there's, there may not be a fire now, but it, there's a potential for fire because it, we have started this uh, started smoke. Uh, aspirin smoke detectors also buy critical time that's needed to investigate the alarm, and then the first responder or whoever is there watching the system can take the appropriate ac action. Aspiration detectors can also be used to address difficult to protect areas. Um, like industrial facilities, warehouses, and cold storage facilities where traditional
uh, edition of 72 to specifically address emergency communication systems. And lastly, chapter 29, which addresses the requirements for notification products that are connected to a single and multiple station household fire alarm systems. So like your typical security burglar alarm systems. Um, chapter 18 is a chapter for protected premise fire alarm systems, like our large notifier systems that are traditionally used in commercial applications. Uh, so the chapter states that you, you are required to put an audible appliance in the sleeping room, uh, and that appliance must be able to produce an alarm signal at a low frequency, specifically centered around 520 hertz, and it has to be with, of a square wave format. So code requirements do dictate that the sound for the alarm has to be uh, 75 dB or higher uh, at the pillow, or at least 15 dB above the ambient sound in, in that sleeping space. Uh, your standard alarm notification horns and sounders are between 2 kilohertz and 4 kilohertz generally. Normally sufficient to wake up and impaired sleeping adult if there's an emergency in the building. However, there are higher risk groups of individuals who low frequency is much more effective. And so those high risk groups are school age children, uh, anyone who is impaired under the influence of drugs or alcohol, or people who may have some form of hearing loss. So a study conducted through Victoria University over more than a decade, uh, published in, a 2000, in 2010, found that a tone at 520 hertz frequency was the most effective at waking sleeping individuals. And the study found that the 520 hertz tone woke almost all, if not, I'm sorry, woke most, if not all of the participants in the study. So some of the findings from that study here, uh, these are what they they were testing against a, a 400 the 520 hertz square wave signal, your three kilohertz tone, which is what we normally use in our horns and sounders today. They also used bed and pillow shakers and just a strobe. So of all of these, the 520 hertz square wave was the most effective at waking up people who are sleeping. So as part of that study, um, the low frequency signal at that 520 hertz square wave woke up 92% of the people between uh, 55 decibels and 75 decibels, so lower than the normal um, requirement for, for the, uh, the decibel level at the pillow in the sleeping space. And they said that the three kilohertz tone, or the normal standard tone that we generate on our other um, horns and sounders today only woke up about 56%. The study found that the low frequency signal um, at 520 hertz was six to ten times more effective at waking up children and young adults than the standard three kilohertz tone. Um, also in adults with some form of hearing loss, that low frequency signal, signal was more than six times as effective as the standard three kilohertz tone. And the strobe lights alone were found to be to have poor waking effectiveness. Just imagine, generally, most people won't wake up just to a flashing light if they're in a deep sleep. Uh, the IBC and IFC code adoption, uh, this went into an effect, effect in January 1st of 2014, it states that uh, audible appliances that are provided for sleeping areas to awaken occupants shall, shall produce a low frequency tone. Uh, so effective again as of January 14th, January 1st, 2014. Uh, these, this is the requirement for sleeping spaces. Uh, the IFC and the IBC do specifically call out Group R occupancies, which are um, places that have a sleeping space. Um, so the R1 group or hotel, which is hotels and motels, 
shall have manual fire alarm system that activates the occupant notification system. And there are some excep exceptions if there are not more than two stories in height or the sleeping spaces have an exit directly to a, a public egress or courtyard. Um, it also permits the fire alarm system to be activated by a sprinkler system and provide occupant notification for uh, our two occupancies or colleges and universities, uh, an automatic smoke detection system that activates the, uh, activates the occupant notification system. So again, re referencing a automatic sm um, smoke detection system to trigger the, the audibles. Excuse me, Jacob? Yes. Hello, Jacob. Hi, it's Ann. I am yes, jumping in. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to address you and the entire audience um, that we are having some some weather issues, and if we do lose power and all get disconnected, I just wanted to let the audience know that we will have the we'll f complete the recording with you of the presentation, and we'll send that presentation to all. So I just wanted to put that out there in case we do uh, fall victim to the weather. But sorry to sorry to interrupt. Great, no problem. Thank you, Ann. Thank you. Uh, so one of the additional requirements for low frequency products is that they do have to comply with a with marking requirements. So this is the first time that NFPA has required a specific frequency for notification appliance. And as a result of that, uh, UL Technical, Technical Committee uh, decided that it was a requirement to mark on the housing um, that this is a low frequency sounder uh, to distinguish these from the non -low, no low frequency devices that are already out in the field. So again, just to, to, to cover again, applications are hotels and motels, college and university dorms, assisted living and nursing home facilities, and new apartments and condominiums. So the product design for uh, the offering that Notifier sells is a, a custom product that was designed around the five, that 520 hertz tone and was set up to provide the maximum sound output utilizing an efficient circuit design and trying to keep a small a small footprint. So our low frequency sounders are the same footprint as our normal um, or combination horn strobe devices. And just to close out, we're going to talk quickly about test and inspection. So why are inspections critical? critical? Um, having advanced technology and great products and protecting our facilities is, is one thing, but to have the best system, even the best system needs to be periodically tested and inspected to make sure that it's functioning properly. So all the components of a fire protection system require testing and inspection based on NFPA version uh, that's adopted by the local jurisdiction and approved by the local AHJ. Uh, test and inspections also reduce unwanted um, false alarms and provide uh, potentially, uh, I'm sorry, identify potential system inefficiencies or deficiencies that can be addressed before they become real problems. So the results of these tests and inspections need to be kept by the building and or and local HJ may request this documentation for review at any time. So among other required documentation, I'm sure that has to be maintained by building owners or facility managers. It's easy to understand how these documents can get lost, misplaced, or just forgotten. Many businesses are moving to paperless options, so why not move your test and inspection documents to that same platform? Uh, whether it's internal facility personnel or who are conducting the inspections alone or in conjunction with a contractor, or if you contract an outside vendor to perform these activities, uh, keeping track of the completed reports and inspection results is super critical. So the inconvenience and costs that are associated with the disruption of normal day-to-day -day business operations uh, is a major concern for building owners and facility managers. So limiting the downtime and the interruptions of performing these periodic uh, tests that are required could save valuable resources. Uh, using an automated test inspection activities uh, has, been come, has become more common over the last few years. So many people are using software, mobile devices, and mobile applications to increase the efficiency of their inspection processes. 
so this has decreased your inspection times from anywhere between 25 to 50 percent, depending upon what you were using um, before you started using this automated test and inspection software. Uh, these solutions have also made it possible to have more consistent and compliant reports because now every report is generated automatically by a system and they all look the same, they have the same look and feel, and you're making sure that all the devices have been tested and um, have a disposition. So automated testing software can be used for more than just your fire alarm equipment. Uh, many software solutions can also be used to test, inspect, and create report safe systems, including sprinklers, emergency lighting, fire extinguishers, and more. Um, I've even heard of customers using automated test software to test um, the power strips in a location. The Notifier solution is the uh, Inspection Manager software from Evance. So Evance Services is a comprehensive field-connected solution that automates and centralizes all the building's test and inspection activities using a mobile application. The Inspection Manager app provides a comprehensive device list and an easy-to-view session progress. It also allows users to create custom test plans and provides flexibility for inspectors to add or edit devices on the fly while they're in the field using an intuitive interface. Uh, the events application is a flexible solution that allows inspectors to have a direct connection to notify alarm system. So any addressable device activations that come through from a support panel will automatically be transmitted to the inspection manager mobile app allowing inspectors to verify the device is reporting correctly and then quickly mark the device uh, as passed. Uh, any other manufacturer fire alarm systems can also be tested using uh, the Notifier Inspection Manager solution and they would use uh, barcodes and scanning or, or other methods to be able to implement those, those uh, non-Honeywell or non-Notifier systems. And then completed inspection reports can also be generated directly from that mobile app and then sent directly to the end user or save to a secure cloud database for later viewing or printing. Uh, the Events Inspection Manager app um, supports all of the listed uh, reporting formats, including NFPA 72, 25, NFPA 10, and uh, Joint Commission for Hospitals and Healthcare Facilities. So that brings us to the end of our, our webinar. So I guess we want to open up for questions now. Yeah, surely. Thank you, Jacob. And thank you to uh, those in the audience that have sent in their questions. Uh, we do have a number of questions and we have, do have a little time, so we'll jump right in. Um, let's see, I'll start from the one of the um, later subjects you were talking about uh, in your presentation, low frequency notification uh, and the different scenarios and requirements there. So uh, starting off, I wanted to ask you um, broadly, are low frequency sounders required in all jurisdictions now? So they, it depends on the version of NFPA and IBC that has been adopted in that jurisdiction. Um, but currently there are only seven states that have not adopted um, low frequency in some form. All other jurisdictions either have some, some for low frequency or they have regional uh, ad adaptation for low frequency sounders. Okay, thank you. So drilling in a little bit more on some specific uh, types of facilities uh, and questions we got uh, around that, um, for prison cells uh, in correctional facilities, um, the question is simply uh, how do you make those items, uh, the equipment you were speaking of, how do you make it inmate proof uh, for tampering, I suppose? Sure. Have you run into so that? Yes, so um, in, in prison cells, um, there's the requirement to have anti-ligature. So you want to make sure that, you know, there's nobody's going to try to wrap something around a device or to, to hang or harm themselves. Um, you also want to prevent um, them tampering with the device itself and causing false alarms. So with an aspiration system, there are very discrete sampling points that, uh, that can be run into each cell or uh, as part of the, the the ducting system, so we can use that those types of things to be able to detect smoke without having a, the normal spot type detector in each cell. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and just one more on a specific type of facility. Um, in a school building, uh, daycare, uh, so for, for younger children, I suppose, are naps considered sleeping? Uh, so, you know, would a facility manager need to follow those sleeping room guidelines for a, um, a daycare? I suppose that could also be a, a preschool setting. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And I guess that as a follow up, so I'm wondering if they're referring to the low frequency sounders or to CO detection. Um, yes, low frequency specifically so, here, but. So, so that it wouldn't be required for, um, for the, for those wouldn't be considered sleeping spaces because there would be um, active adults who are there um, monitoring situations similar to a hospital. Hospitals have patients who have in their sleeping rooms there as well, but uh, the low frequency sounders are not required because there are um, there are people there to to monitor the the system and the the applications. Ah, uh, okay, I see. Okay. So then um, we'll, we'll get back a little broader for the fire and life safety equipment um, that you've been talking about um, throughout the, the past hour. Um, and what for upgrading an existing or older system, which I'm sure is the case in many uh, facilities, what, uh, what systems would you recommend that, you know, that you've spoken on today? What systems would you recommend for upgrading an existing or older system? How would you, how would you recommend going about, you know, evaluating that? Um, it I, I would start with um, whatever the, the current local uh, jurisdiction requirements are. Um, you want to make sure that you're at least meeting those those uh, requirements for per AHJ and for your jurisdiction. And they could be different from state to state. Um, so you would want to start there. Um, but you also want to make sure that you are positioned for the future. So knowing that, uh, you know, for, for sleeping spaces, sounders are required. You want to make sure if you are doing an upgrade, you're taking that into consideration and you might as well go ahead and install those low frequency sounder devices in those applications because the, the code will eventually mandate that there, there will be a requirement. Okay, thank you. And uh, along those lines of, of um, you know, upgrades and retrofits, would you recommend or do you have any thoughts on recommending uh, copper or fiber optic cables for the data transfer to the control panels? Um, if it's short distances within a building, um, usually copper is fine. Uh, if you're going between buildings or you're, you're, you're going longer distances, then fiber is definitely recommended. Um, with wire, the distances are limited. You can get much longer distances if you're, if you're using fiber optic cable. Um, and if you're going externally from the building, you know, in between one building to the next, then you absolutely want to use fiber fiber optic cable um, just to make sure that you are protected against lightning um, and just the normal erosion of the of the copper wire that could happen if you're tunneling under underground or even through conduit. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And uh, we'll just uh, jump to another um, area, the aspiration detection equipment that you talked about. Um, can, you, can you comment on what's the design coverage per square feet for a single, um, detection sensor in terms of how, how many would you need for you know per square feet, I guess is the question. So for aspiration detection, it you would still you would usually generally need one detector. Um, but okay. the coverage would be determined by uh, a pipe network. So you can cover a, a fairly large area with a single detector. Um, it would just have to be mapped out depending upon the the size and shape of the of the area um, would determine what how long of pipe length of pipe you need and where you your sampling points. Okay. Okay. So, in uh, let's go back also further to the beginning of your presentation because we did get some questions on uh, bi-directional amplifiers. So um, the question is, will the notifier um, bi-directional amplifier equipment work with other fire alarm systems? Uh, so I'm, I'm seeing that as if there's existing equipment in the building, uh, how does your um, bi-directional amplifier equipment fit in or integrate with others? Yeah, so you, you can use the uh, the BDA system from Notifier with other fire alarm systems. Um, there's uh, contact closures that can monitor the and supervise the BDA system. Okay, so then another question about um, BDAs is, Let's see, uh, let's look through here. How about, um, 
and talked about the integration. Okay, so how to clean buildings that should use simplex or the duplex BDAs? So I guess where is the line of demarcation when you're when you're choosing between simplex or duplex? Um, this asker works in a 27,000 square foot building, which includes two stories above ground and a basement. So what would be your recommendation for equipment there? So so all BDAs are are duplex. They're, they are two way communication. Um, and the, the best method to determine whether a BDA system is required is to do a, a site survey. Uh, so okay. there's there's uh, people who are trained and there's a method of performing a, uh, a coverage survey to determine whether or not the radio signals will be able to penetrate the building and to be able to have um, sufficient coverage in all areas of the building. Okay, wonderful, thank you. So let's see, we have time for about one more question. So I will um, will ask about uh, the protocol here. What, what protocol uh, is noted the fire system using? For instance, is it uh, the TCP IP protocol or, or how does that um, how does that work? Uh, protocol for which for? Uh, it, I'm sorry, this is for the notifier system. I'm not sure um, what the specifics are here. Um, well, we can we can move on. We, we can always follow up just to let everyone on the sure, call we know as well. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just saying yes. We can we can follow up on it with an answer yes. for that one. Certainly, of course, and I, that's why I wanted to let everyone know if we haven't gotten to your question, um, you you will be certainly followed up with. Uh, so let's see. Just okay. Then I'm going to follow up on the bi-directional um, question that we just talked about, and you talked about the survey for that 27,000 square foot building. Uh, who would conduct that that RF survey, or who who in your uh, experience would conduct that? So for Notifier, we have uh, what we call engineered systems distributors, um, or our okay. our partners who. Uh, sell and install and maintain our systems. So they're all uh, factory tra trained to be able to conduct survey. Okay, wonderful, thank you. So um, we have time for one last question. And uh, what? And I wanna thank everyone, of course, for sending in their questions. And as I mentioned, um, we will be able to follow up uh, specifically if your question has not been answered. But my last question, Jacob, for you then is uh, actually something you had just addressed a few minutes ago regarding ceiling mounting requirements for CR CO detectors. Uh, could you just repeat that um, the, the, was the question? Sure. So uh, ceiling mounted detectors for, for CO, you can mount the detectors on the ceiling. Um, they just need to be no less than uh, four inches away from the wall and within uh, three feet of the, the peak if it's a vaulted ceiling. Okay, wonderful. And so then before we wrap it up, I do want to mention about um, you know distributors because we've had some equipment questions here. So um, the distributors in the region for notifier products can be found on your website. Is that is that correct to find the, the closest source? Yes, that's correct. Oh, okay, I just want to remember that. That's on notifier.com. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's it. I want to thank you, Jacob, for your time uh, and for the presentation and for the Q&A as well. No problem. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Yes, of course. And of course, to uh, thanks to Notifier by Honeywell for sponsoring this presentation and our audience for attending. Uh, we will uh, have your questions addressed if we didn't get to all of them. Um, sorry about that. And a recording of this talk will be available online for your review at the facilityexecutive.com website. You can also learn more, as we mentioned, um, about the company, its offerings, and other best practices at notifier.com. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, and, and lastly, I wanted to mention for those of you and in the Arlington, Virginia area, I'd invite you to check out an event that Facility Executive Magazine is hosting on September 19th. This event is Facility Executive Live. Uh, it's a one-day conference and networking event, and it's on the George Mason University campus in Arlington, Virginia. You can learn more, more about that at facilityexecutivelive.com. So again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Notify, and have a great day.